Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for everyone to be able to join us and get online. So let's wait a few moments before we start. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. A very warm welcome to today's webinar on the Substance Use Professional's Guide to Addressing Medical Cannabis in Substance Use Treatment Settings. It's going to be a great session, so we are looking forward to it. My name is Rasha Abihana. I'm the Scientific Support Coordinator, and I'm part of the Scientific Support Team at ISAP. I will begin by saying a little about ISAP. ISAP is a membership organization with over 27,000 members worldwide, working in the fields of substance use, prevention, treatment, and recovery support. Our aim is to connect professionals through networking, knowledge share, and training, sharing the very best in evidence space ethical approaches, and promoting qualities in all areas of prevention, treatment, and recovery care practice. If you've not done so already, please head over to our website, isop.net. You will find information on how to sign up for a free membership. The website has also a wealth of resources and publications for you to enjoy. I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Kindly note that Spanish interpretation is available for this webinar and can be accessed via the Interactio platform. Please find the link to listen to the Spanish audio in the GoToWebinar chat box. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our presenter by typing your question at any time into the question span of the webinar interface on your screen. We will collect these questions and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And if you miss anything, don't worry, a recording of this webinar will be made available for you to watch on demand after the event and you can also share it with your network. We hope that you will stay with us for what promises to be an illuminating session. Now, I'm delighted to tell you a little bit about today's webinar and introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Aaron Norton. Dr. Aaron Norton is the Executive Director of the National Board of Forensic Evaluators and a visiting instructor at the University of South Florida Department of Mental Health Law and Policy. Dr. Norton is a licensed mental health counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist, certified forensic mental health evaluator, and certified master's level addictions professional. In this webinar, you will be provided with a brief overview of disorder treated by medical cannabis and the use of a decision-made king matrix for medical cannabis. We are thrilled to have you today, Dr. Norton, and we are sure that this session will be extremely valuable to our members around the world. It's my pleasure to hand over to you. Dr. Norton, the floor is yours. All right, welcome everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, this to me is a very important topic. Um, it's also a topic that can be somewhat controversial. Um, I am very much in favor of people being able to have a reasonable dialogue about controversial topics and to learn and for us to try and challenge ourselves to explore different sides of the same perspective or the same issue. And this is certainly one of those issues. I've found that sometimes I'll do a presentation and some people will really love it and some people will really not like it very much. 
um, and uh, would love to see some of your feedback about today. But I wanted to start by telling you about why this topic became important to me and why I ended up writing some guidelines for counselors uh, to help guide their treatment decisions when clients present with medical cannabis cards in treatment settings. Part of my practice involves providing supervision for interns who are pursuing their license in counseling. In the United States, in every one of our states, we have licenses for counselors, and counselors in each state can diagnose and treat mental disorders, but they can't diagnose and treat other kinds of disorders that are not considered mental disorders, such as diabetes or hypertension or multiple sclerosis. Uh, so then we start to notice in my state, after legalizing medical cannabis, and I'll call it cannabis today instead of marijuana, by the way, um, but in my state, when we legalize medical cannabis, some of my interns working in treatment settings in the community would come to me with some dilemmas. An example of a dilemma would be a man who had his third charge for driving under the influence of a substance and his DUI charge was cannabis related and he'd had a couple possession of cannabis charges on his record and he had a pretty extensive history of problem with various substances and had a diagnosable substance use disorder. And uh, then when, after being arrested for a DUI, he was required to participate in treatment in order to try and get his driver's license back. So one of my interns was his treating therapist and uh, she explained to him that while he's in the outpatient substance use treatment program, he would have to abstain from all drugs, including cannabis, and that he would be drug tested regularly. And he told her that he doesn't want to stop, and so he's going to continue using, but he's going to go get a card that gives him, that essentially um, makes it legal for him to use cannabis medicinally. And then this put her into a bit of a predicament, because the question for her is, what do I do with this client? I'm supposed to provide him with treatment. I'm supposed to help him to achieve remission from his substance use disorder. I'm supposed to reduce the likelihood that he will be a risk to himself or other people when driving on the road in the future. I can't just pass him through treatment successfully if nothing's changing and he's still using just because he has a card. But on the other hand, I'm not a physician, and so I can't tell him to stop using what a physician is calling medicine. So she wasn't really sure what to do with him. And some, at the same time, I had another intern that worked in a program that worked with uh, people who had lost custody of their children because of substance-related child abuse and neglect. And she was encountering the same issue in her agency where people would start treatment. They would be told that they have to abstain they would go get a medical card and then say, well, now you can't make me stop. And then she doesn't know what to do because if they're still doing the same thing, then how can she say that they're in remission and that their prognosis is good and complete them successfully? So I decided that what would be very helpful for my interns and for students would be to create a decision matrix that would help them to use information from best practice guidelines to inform their treatment decisions when they're working with these clients. And then that tool became very useful and other people started using it. And I started getting requests for presenting about it and it got published in a few counseling magazines and has kind of taken off from there. So one thing that I'd like to do today is to introduce you to that tool. But first, I really wanna provide a, a brief overview about medical cannabis. I'd like to begin by saying that physicians who are part of the process for people to get their card to legally use medical cannabis here in the US in research are underinformed about cannabis. They acknowledge that they haven't learned about medical cannabis in medical school, that they know very little about it. They do want it to be an option for their patients, but they're also very concerned 
about health risks associated with cannabis. And research has also demonstrated that in medical school, um, very few students are saying that they're learning anything about medical cannabis. So they go into the field not really having an understanding, and yet they will have patients that will be presenting and asking for their help and securing a medical cannabis card. Now, it's very difficult for us to conduct research on cannabis, whether we're researching medical cannabis or we're researching adverse health effects of cannabis. We could take almost any question about cannabis and use it as a good example. In this case, we'll use the question, does medical cannabis alleviate adverse effects of the opioid epidemic? So in other words, if we make medical cannabis an option, will we see fewer problems related to opiates? Will we see fewer overdoses, for example, or maybe lower use rates related to opioids? Or a reduction in emergency department visits associated with opioid use? You would think that this could be a pretty easy question to answer, but I, from the year 2014 forward, I found 15 studies that explored this question in different ways. Eight of those studies concluded that medical cannabis, that there was evidence that medical cannabis was alleviating the opioid epidemic. Seven studies concluded that it didn't, and some of them concluded that it actually made the problem worse. And I consider that inconclusive. To me, that means we really don't know. But the problem I've encountered is having attended various medical cannabis trainings, I've seen that some presenters will only tell you about the eight studies that show that medical cannabis alleviates the opioid pandemic epidemic, or they'll show you the seven studies suggesting that it doesn't. But I've never seen anybody tell you about all of those studies. And so you can attend a training and you can get very different ideas about what we can know or not know about cannabis based on um, who the presenter was and which studies they decided to show you and which studies they did not show you. They might not even know about the studies that disagree with their perspective. And so I'm very concerned we present on this topic. We're not giving people the big picture. We're just cherry picking, picking certain studies and then using those to support our positions. And I don't think that's the best way to go about things. But research is very challenging for lots of reasons. I mean, think about the perfect study to explore the adverse health effects of cannabis. You'd have to take a very large sample of people, randomly sampled that are very representative of the population that you're researching. You would have to randomly assign them into different groups. You'd have to have different age cohorts, starting from um, maybe teenagers or children, all the way through to the oldest and wisest among us, our elderly populations. And then you'd have to assign these groups to various conditions. You'd have to have a placebo group. You'd have to have a control group. You would have to have um, an experimental group that's divided into subgroups with varying doses. And then you'd have to give them THC for decades into the future throughout their lifespan, and then controlling for as many variables as you can, try to point out meaningful differences between the different groups. And that study, of course, does not exist because not only would it be very time consuming and expensive, but you'd never be able to get it through an institutional review board at a university. Um, I mean, imagine a university giving permission to a researcher to give THC to children and adolescents for the rest of their lives and then see if it messes things up in their brain. This is not going to be considered ethical. So instead, we do correlational research but we all know that a limitation there is that correlation does not equal causation. And ultimately we can't really prove what cannabis is causing or not causing. We can only suggest it based on evidence. Or we can do animal research, but a lot of people point out there are probably dramatic differences in what THC might do for a rat that has a two year lifespan and what it might do for a human being in the course of say 50 years of time. So. Obviously, um, what we can say conclusively is going to be limited. So what if there was a resource 
where a large group of scientists and experts came together and they examined all of the evidence and they told you uh, or drew conclusions about what we can say with varying levels of confidence about both the adverse health effects of cannabis and the medicinal benefits of cannabis. Well, I think the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine did a pretty good job of accomplishing exactly that in 2017 when they published this report, The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids. In this, um, in this report, which is a very lengthy report, they created different levels of evidence and they reviewed the totality of research on cannabis. So they didn't just pick and choose a study here and there. And then they determined what can we say with a pretty high level of confidence and what can we not say based on the research so far. And if we start by looking at their research on medical use of cannabis, these are the conditions for which they found at least a moderate degree of evidence that medical cannabis could help with. Those conditions include chronic pain in adults, reduction of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. That, by the way, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, one of the places in the brain that has a large concentration of receptor sites for THC is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is involved in a lot of regulatory processes in the body. And one of those includes appetite. And in the case of THC, when THC binds to receptor sites, in regions of the brain like the hypothalamus, a, a sensation gets produced where the brain thinks that we are essentially starving. And then people will tend to experience high levels of craving for high calorie food, um, food rich in carbohydrates or sugars or fats. And here in a lot of places, there's a term for this, it's called the munchies. <laughs> so this, imagine that you were a cancer patient and you were participating in chemotherapy. And because of that chemotherapy, you're having a very hard time stomaching food. You try to eat and in spite of the nausea, and maybe you get sick and you actually vomit up food that you'd eaten. You're having a very hard time just taking in nutrients. I think that medical THC then um, could be very helpful for such a patient to help to counter the nausea and the vomiting so that they can ingest food again. And uh, another finding for which there was at least moderate evidence is the reduction of patient report, reported spasticity related to multiple sclerosis. And also short-term sleep outcomes in individuals with sleep disturbance associated with several different conditions. Now, I do wanna point out, this is only short-term sleep outcomes. There is actually research that suggests that long-term, uh, for long-term use, medical THC is not particularly helpful for sleep and might actually make it worse in the long run. But we can say the same thing for a lot of other medications that physicians prescribe for sleep problems, like Lunesta, Sonata, Ambien. Um, they tend to work short-term. They tend to not work so well long-term as people develop a tolerance to those medications. This is a little bit of a side note. But in roughly 80% of cases of insomnia, the causes are thoughts and behaviors, not an underlying biomedical condition like sleep apnea, for example. And that's why the American Academy of Physicians suggests that the front line of treatment for insomnia should be cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. But in reality, here in the US, it's a pill, a pill that does not teach people to address their thoughts and their behaviors. So this is a bit of a problem and um, something that we certainly are contending with all over the world, I think. So when we look at the findings from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, what we see in this chart is there is only one condition for which there is at least, for which there is conclusive evidence that medical cannabis can be helpful. Only one condition out of all the conditions in the research up to that point. There were two conditions for which there was substantial evidence, one condition with at least moderate or a medium amount of evidence, five conditions with very little evidence, and then 11 conditions that have been researched from which we can draw 
essentially no conclusions whatsoever. We really don't know, or we know that it doesn't help actually. And so when we look at this, this is not exactly a gleaming report for medical cannabis. It really suggests that there are very few conditions that medical cannabis could be helpful for. And one thing that's important to notice is none of them are mental disorders. Uh, I think that's an important point, at least for me, because I'm a mental health professional. And so the clients I work with are primarily um, using medical cannabis to try and, adduce, try and address mental disorders even though there's really not good evidence that medical cannabis will help with those disorders. Now, one thing to point out is that report that NASEM came out with was from 2017. Well, that's already kind of outdated, right? A lot of new things have happened since then. But other researchers have carried the torch forward. Yugel, for example, in 2021, what they tried to do was to update NASEM's work uh, and so they looked at any new research from 2016 forward through 2020 to see if in those four years of research, they could find additional ev strong evidence for support for other conditions. They added epilepsy as one condition that um, at least three out of four studies published in that four year period showed some pretty strong convincing evidence that medical cannabis could be helpful. And a second is chronic non-cancer pain, but note that almost half of the studies didn't support medical cannabis for chronic non-cancer pain. So they kind of concluded that the association with helping with pain is maybe not as solid as previously thought. Other researchers have also um, tried to update the work of NASEM, but we only have so much time to cover them. So um, so I'll just say that new research since NASEM's report hasn't uncovered very many conditions that we can say with a high level of confidence that medical cannabis can successfully treat. And for mental health related or psychiatric conditions, we see that there is an awful lot of evidence that medical cannabis can actually be harmful for those conditions. Now, there's always a question in medicine about the potential benefits versus the potential drawbacks or the adverse health effects. NASEM also researched what we can say with at least a moderate level of confidence that medical cannabis is associated with in terms of adverse health effects. So how will it harm or potentially could harm patients who use it? And there are an awful lot of conditions that were identified in that category. I'm not gonna tell you about those now because we don't have time to cover them all, but the good news is you have it all on your slides. These are all the conditions that the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine found that um, there's some good evidence that medical cannabis contributed to. An awful lot of adverse health effects and public health risks. Here's page one of some of those conditions, page two and page three that you can look at later on and notice a lot of mental health conditions show up in these adverse health effects as being made worse by cannabis instead of better by cannabis. Now, the problem is again, that research only went through 2016 and they published it in 2017. So what about research from 2017 on? No one that I know of has done an exhaustive review, but I have several slides that you can look at later that show isolated studies about adverse health effects of cannabis. And in fact, it was surprising to me that I went to a medical cannabis training and another presenter said that there's virtually no evidence in recent years that cannabis creates adverse health effects for people. This was shocking to me because as you'll see on these slides, there are pages and pages and pages of short summaries that I provided of research finding adverse health effects associated with cannabis. It just goes on and on and on and on. So I think we have to be very careful when we're presenting about these topics to ensure that we don't make bold statements that um, could be pretty easily demonstrated to not be true. Okay, so um, let me skip now to the positions of various associations on cannabis. Now I'm in the United States and um, unfortunately most of the uh, associations that I've researched um, in terms of their positions on medical cannabis are going to be in the U.S. But I'm hopeful that that will still be helpful. 
um, for an international um, group of professionals such as yourself. Uh, if you take the positions of the American Academy of Pediatricians, so these are the physicians who treat children, the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which is the group of physicians who are also experts in addictions, NADAC, which is an association for addictions professionals, and the American Heart Association. All of them have some commonalities in their positions. They all think cannabis is a public health risk. They all think we need to educate patients about risks. They all acknowledge that there's very limited evidence that medical cannabis is helpful. They all think that additional research is needed. None of them are particularly fond of criminalizing cannabis use. They don't think the solution is to throw people in jails and prisons. And they also think that providers should be very cautious about recommending medical cannabis, and they should try to use safer alternatives, and that medical cannabis should be particularly avoided for youth, individuals with substance use disorders, and for treating mental disorders. And in fact, the American Psychiatric Association says, if, a, if an individual has a substance use disorder, we should avoid using potentially addictive medications whenever possible. And the American Society of Addiction Medicine um, wrote, healthcare professionals should recommend cannabis with great caution, if at all, to those with substance use disorders or psychiatric disorders. Healthcare professionals should screen all patients for cannabis and other substance use disorders and refer to treatment as appropriate. I will tell you from firsthand experience, this often does not happen. In fact, in my area, there are um, clinics that you can go to that advertise that they provide medical cannabis. They say, do a quick online questionnaire and we'll let you know if you're likely eligible. Then you come in, you spend just a few minutes with somebody, they ask you a few questions, and then they recommend a medical cannabis card. I've never had a client turned down ever at one of these places, no matter what condition they're complaining of. They could say, I get stressed sometimes, medical cannabis. I have a difficulty sleeping sometimes, medical cannabis. I have a hard time concentrating on my schoolwork sometimes, medical cannabis. It's, it doesn't matter what they complain of, they will get a card. I've never seen anyone turned down at these places which is very concerning to me, and I don't think that's a wise way to practice medicine. When it comes to mental disorders or psychiatric conditions, the American Psychiatric Association says, there is no current scientific evidence that cannabis is in any way beneficial for the treatment of any psychiatric disorder. And in contrast, cannabis can be harmful for people with psychiatric disorders. They say the same thing in a separate statement specifically about post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so in the, among the healthcare professions themselves, there seems to be a consensus. And that consensus uh, is, it converges on many different points that we've covered, but none of them are particularly endorsing or enthusiastic of medical cannabis. And so when people make claims about medical cannabis being a safe cure-all, then it obviously makes a lot of sense to be highly critical. Now, there are also questions about how medical cannabis use or recreational cannabis use for that matter, could impact psychotherapy. Some people say, well, if a client's mildly sedated with cannabis, then maybe they'll open up about things they wouldn't otherwise open up with and that could be a good thing. But also, THC tends to create short-term memory impairment and psychotherapy is very reliant on um, patients having intact memory. They have to be able to remember in various ways the experiences they're having in their therapy appointments. And then there's a legal and ethical question. Can a person who's under the influence of a substance that impairs their thinking lawfully consent to treatment when they're in an impaired state? That raises quite an interesting question. And then there are exposure-based therapies. All psychotherapies have something in common. They all involve encountering something directly. And um, many of them require a person to encounter things directly without a chemical aid. Exposure and response prevention therapy would be a great example. Um, it's important with that therapy approach for clients to engage with something, experience high levels of distress 
but continue engaging until the stress levels come down so that we can reduce or eliminate the irrational connection that the brain has drawn between the stimulus and between adversity. Experience will give them that. But if they're sedated by a substance, then the same effect doesn't happen in the brain. The brain actually can oftentimes sort of um, process the experience in the opposite direction. It can look something like, see, this thing is so dangerous that I have to be sedated to get through it. That's how bad it is. That's sort of what happens instead when people are sedated, but, ex but uh, trying to use exposure-based approaches in many cases. So it kind of brings us back to that um, classic debate about recovery versus harm reduction. Now, I think that there's a great place in society for harm reduction. I would much rather see a harm reduction approach where people may still be using substances that they've developed problems with, but we're reducing the adverse health effects and other negative effects on their life um, as best as we can. I think that's a lot better than doing nothing. But I'm also very passionate about recovery, which I think oftentimes will help us to get to the underlying causes and contributors to the problems that we develop with both substance use disorders and mental disorders. But that's for another presentation, I suppose. Um, dosing considerations are kind of good to know about. Um, we won't have time to go into detail about this, but what I can tell you is that there's a big difference between what experts who create uh, medical cannabis products say um, people should be dosed with and what's actually happening in the community here in the US, in states where medical cannabis is legal. To give you an example, experts tend to say that most conditions that respond to medical THC will respond to doses of 10 milligrams or less. And that if a patient is using more than 10 milligrams and they're over medicated, and that's not the goal of medicine. The goal of medicine is not to make you feel euphoric or high or wonderful. Um, that's abnormal actually. And that's something the brain tries to counterreact against um, as when it happens chronically. Instead, the goal of medicine is really to help people function as normally as possible in a society, right? And that's very different than being high or intoxicated. But what I see is that the low end of what my clients use is 10 milligrams. They use way more than 10 milligram dosages. They use far heavier um, quantities than what would be medically recommended by experts on medical cannabis. So this is a problem where there's a gap between research and between actual frontline clinical practice. Uh, I won't tell you this story, but, uh, but uh, the short version is you can go to any website of a lot of these uh, medical cannabis clinics and you can see that they advertise how easy it is and how you don't even have to pay if they deny you a card but they don't have to worry about that because they never seem to deny anybody a card. Now, I'm particularly concerned because I do evaluations for the courts in forensic cases as well, and I've seen an increase since 2015 or so of cases where people suddenly start to experience psychosis in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s, and they never experienced it before, or manic episodes, and that's highly unusual because typically people with a biological predisposition towards a psychotic disorder or a bipolar disorder will have their first psychotic symptoms in adolescence or in early adulthood. In every single case that I've evaluated for the courts, there's been one common denominator. They started using medical THC, typically regularly. And then they began to develop psychotic symptoms and manic symptoms. And the sad part is, even when they then stop using the medical THC, the symptoms don't go away unless they're on an antipsychotic medication or a mood stabilizer in most cases. This is good evidence, and there's a tremendous amount of research on this, that a subset of people have a biological predisposition towards a psychotic disorder or a bipolar disorder. And it takes certain stressful experiences on the brain, sort of the diathesis stress model, to trigger or bring out those full-blown symptoms. Cannabis, specifically THC from cannabis, tends to produce that exact situation. It tends to be the triggering experience in the brain 
that people with these predispositions um, may develop psychosis from. It will trigger that process. And sadly, once it's been triggered, in many cases, it's irreversible. It's a manageable condition. It can be treated, but it doesn't go away. And they, so they, these are individuals with a family history of psychotic disorders and bipolar disorders. They go to a, a medical cannabis clinic with very little screening. They get a card. They start using heavy quantities of THC. They end up with a psychotic disorder for life. And this is highly concerning to me. So I think we have to do something about the gap between clinical research and clinical practice. There's also a growing body of research that suggests that here in the US, the first groups of people that got medical cannabis cards are mostly individuals with substance use disorders who want to continue using substances without having to worry about being convicted of a crime and doing so. So, um, in other words, only a minority of people who get medical cannabis cards in the US are individuals who are legitimately using it for medicinal purposes. That's usually not the primary motivation, but it is sometimes. So then how do we differentiate between individuals who are just using cannabis medically and those who are using it in a problematic way? Well, this is a tool called the Decision Matrix for Counselors Encountering Medical Cannabis Use in Treatment Settings. And you have it in your handouts. You have different versions of it, I think, actually in your handouts. This version was published in the Advocate Magazine of the American Mental Health Counselors Association. And although it might be hard to see on your screen, when a client comes in, the first question is, have they been diagnosed with a substance use disorder? So there needs to be a thorough evaluation or an assessment using multiple data sources to determine whether it is likely that this individual has a substance use disorder. If they do not seem to have a substance use disorder based on the evidence available, then the next question is, do they want to stop using medical THC? If the answer is yes, they do want to stop using, then the counselor can collaborate with the prescriber or the healthcare professional who recommended medical cannabis to begin with to adopt non-addictive options and to look for alternatives to medical THC. Now, if the, the client is not interested in stopping, then we tend to recommend some psychoeducation, some preventative work, and maybe some harm reduction approaches to help reduce the likelihood that they will develop a problem with a cannabis use disorder. And we have various recommendations for what you can do um, to help in those cases. But what if the client does have a substance use disorder? So the answer is yes. Then the next question is, do they want to stop using medical THC? And if the answer is yes, then you can go right back to collaborating with the physician for non-addictive alternative options. But if the answer is no, if they want to continue using medical THC, then the next question is, how severe is their substance use disorder? Is it a mild disorder or is it a moderate or severe disorder? This question is important because people with mild substance use disorders have a greater likelihood of benefiting from a harm reduction approach um, than individuals with more severe substance use disorders. I shouldn't say that actually. It's, it's not really about, I mean, I think even individuals with severe substance use disorders can benefit from harm reduction, but they won't be likely to achieve remission status um, or they'll be less likely to achieve and sustain remission status if they have a more severe substance use disorder when using a harm reduction approach. So the next question is, does the counselor have leverage? Now, the American Society of Addiction Medicine tends to toss around that term a lot. And what they mean is, is this client coming to you because they want something from you for which treatment is necessary to obtain? For example, the client who loses their driver's license because of DUI charges comes to treatment and if they complete successfully, then they can get their privilege to drive back. That's a situation where you have leverage. And you don't just ethically pass the client through because they have a medical cannabis card without anything changing and then let them go back on the road and drive again and potentially be a risk to themselves and others. So you, you would respectfully use that leverage in that case. You would explain to them, I know that you have a medical cannabis card and uh, I also 
uh, have concluded that you have a moderate or severe substance use disorder. And there's, and it appears that your substance use is creating significant problems. You're coming to me for treatment that will, for which a driver's license will depend on. I have to be able to demonstrate that you're in remission status and that you have a good prognosis and, and that you've completed successfully in order for you to possibly get your driver's license back. I can't pass you through treatment successfully if nothing is changing. So we have a predicament here. And what I would like to suggest is that you sign a release form that allows me to communicate with your physician so that I can send your physician a letter. And in that letter, I'm going to explain why you came to treatment. I'm going to explain what my diagnosis is, and I'm going to detail the specific symptoms of a substance use disorder that I've identified and how you meet that criteria. I'm then going to quote guidelines from the American Medical Association and the American Society of Addiction Medicine about how medical THC would generally should generally be avoided in cases such as this. And then I'm going to ask your physician um, if there if there are suitable alternatives that are not addictive or have a lower abuse potential. And um, the client can decline to sign such a release form or they can decide to sign it. And if they decline in many play treatment settings where there's leverage, then the treatment program might say, well, then I can't work with you if you're not going to allow me to do my job and this is mandated treatment, then you're not going to be able to get treated in this particular program. And oftentimes clients will then decide to sign a release form. But in other cases, a treatment provider might decide to, to work with the person anyway and really try to use a harm reduction approach and see if the client can reach remission status even though they're still using a potentially addictive medication. There certainly is some room for clinical judgment on a case-by-case -case basis here. And for you to use your own style and approach to treatment when you're trying to apply this, uh, these guidelines or this matrix. Now, the physician, if I send a letter to a physician, sometimes they'll make a change because remember, a lot of physicians don't know what you know. They don't know about the three DUIs or they don't know about all of the signs of a substance use disorder because they only spent a few minutes with somebody and that somebody, that client may not have even told them about these things. So um, the physician, it's important for this physician to know what you know, for there to be communication so that they can do their job as best as possible to best help this client and also protect the public while they're at it. Now, if the physician does nothing or just, or well, essentially if the physician does nothing, then I go back to the client and I say, well, we still have the same predicament. So I'll offer you another option. What about a second opinion? I can refer you to a physician who can advise you about your medication since I can't because I'm a counselor. And that physician can be a board certified addiction medicine specialist or essentially any physician who has particular expertise in addictions and knows that world well. That physician can meet with you. I'll provide a report to them. And then that physician can offer an opinion on whether medical THC is medically necessary or whether there are appropriate alternatives that are not addictive that could be used instead. So far, in the small number of cases where clients have gotten that far in the process where we're referring for a second opinion, I have never had a physician disagree with me. In every single case, when I send that report in, the um, addiction medicine specialist has said, yeah, there are plenty of safer alternatives. We don't need medical THC in this case. I would recommend these conditions and I will help treat this patient to address their medical concerns while they're in treatment so they can complete successfully. So, that's the short version of the decision matrix. There's an awful lot more that we can say about it, but I believe uh, we've also sort of reached, we've come close to the point where we're going to be taking questions and answers. So I will also just let you know before we do that, I'll spend just a couple more minutes here, that there is an electronic version of this matrix. And what that electronic version allows you to do is to, answer questions about your client, and then using conditional logic, depending on how you answer questions, 
it will ask you the next question in the series until eventually you reach a point, an end point, where it suggests an option to consider based on some of these guidelines written by associations. So that tool is available for you. And also in the slides that you have, I have, I think, four different case scenarios that can be used to practice using this tool. And you will arrive at different end results depending on how you answer questions based on these scenarios. So um, with that all being said, uh, this, is a, this is a topic that sometimes I present for eight hours on, and this is a very condensed version. So unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to get into um, some of these clinical scenarios and then use them as examples with the matrix, but you at least have them in your slides and can practice them on your own. And I would love to then shift and see if we have some questions to answer. All Thank right. you so I'm much. Gonna... Oh, go ahead. So, uh, yes, we'll just uh, start to receive questions now. Uh, thank you again for the excellent, rich, and oriented presentation. It was extremely helpful to understand the complexity of this topic, and we are receiving a lot of uh, positive comments. So, uh, I'm just checking now the questions. As a reminder, sorry, yeah. yeah, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was going to say while you're while you're looking for some questions. Um, I, I really want to stress something. Um, just for full disclosure, in, in my state, I voted in support of medical cannabis. I do personally believe that it should be an option. And remember that NASEM and other researchers have concluded that there is evidence that medical THC can be helpful for at least a small number of medical conditions. And I want those individuals to be able to have medical THC as an option. I think it could be helpful for them. I am a strong critic of how we are doing this though, because what I see in the frontline area of practice is a sort of free for all. Anybody who wants a card can get a card if they go to the right place. And most of them are using the card really because they want to, to experience a high or a euphoria without a legal consequence, or they want to reduce stress. Um, but, they're using medical THC for conditions for which medical THC tends to not be helpful or even makes the situation worse. And what they're missing out on is the experience of using approaches that tend to more efficaciously address these issues. And so I really think physicians have to be more thorough and spend more time assessing on a case-by-case -case basis whether medical THC is a good option. And I think they should adhere to the guidelines that their own associations have created that say that they should be trying non-addictive options um, before they res revert to potentially addictive treatment options. Yes, I agree with you. So uh, let's get right into, into it with our yeah. first question. Uh, okay, so um, there's a question about the risk factors because it was uh, mentioned in the introduction. So uh, is this linked to the gender and the age range uh, for people regarding, like, is it, uh, is it higher for a certain gender and age range? Yes, that's a good question. So, um, the, for, so NASEM, you'll see this slide in the presentation, NASEM concluded that there is good evidence that these factors are risk factors associated with developing a cannabis use disorder. Being male, being male and smoking cigarettes, an earlier age of initiation of cannabis use, the earlier somebody starts, the greater the likelihood they develop the problem. Because essentially, especially if they're regularly using, they are conditioning the still developing brain to require a chemical um, in order to try to achieve some form of chemical regulation. So they're more likely to, to essentially become dependent on the substance as an adult. Um, more frequent use is associated with a greater likelihood of developing a problem. That's not surprising. 
a co-occurring diagnosis of major depressive disorder, the use of different combinations of drugs, oppositional behaviors during adolescence, younger age of initiation of alcohol consumption, nicotine use during adolescence, substance use by the parents of adolescents, antisocial behaviors during adolescence, childhood sexual abuse, a history of psychiatric treatment, and an increased severity of PTSD symptoms. We're not saying that cannabis causes these things, and we're not saying that these things cause cannabis use disorders per se. We're saying that there is a relationship that individuals with these characteristics are going to be at a greater, um, are more likely to develop a cannabis use disorder than individuals who do not have these characteristics or experiences. And there is other research. So um, and a, another researcher um, conclude, looked at the question a little bit differently, which is what are the risk factors for daily cannabis use? That's not the same as risk factors for developing a cannabis use disorder, but probably a similar question in a way. And they found actually older age was a risk factor for daily cannabis use. Um, but remember, only among young adults. So what they're saying is, for example, like a 25-year-old might be more likely to develop um, or more likely to be using cannabis daily than, say, a 15-year-old would. That might have a lot to do with access, though. Male sex, just like NASIM found, higher levels of family stress and other stress, use of alcohol, cigarettes, and other tobacco products, parents, siblings, and friends who smoke cigarettes, a higher body mass index, higher levels of impulsivity and novelty speaking, and lower self-esteem. All of these variables increase the odds of daily cannabis use. So hopefully that helps to answer the question about risk factors. Yes, I think this is a very important aspect that people need to consider. Yes, thank you for answering this. Uh, we had another question about um, the, the matrix. Is it possible to access the matrix uh, globally? And uh, maybe I can add to this if this can if this should be like culturally adapted to to a, a country, for example, because it differs between one country and another. Absolutely. So um, I'll point out a couple things. First, I'm going to take the link to this matrix, and I'm going to go ahead and put it into the chat box. You have it in your slides, but you know sometimes it's easier to. Um, actually, I don't think I have access to the chat box, come to think of it. So, but you have it in your slides and it's right here at the top, surveymonkey.com slash ours and Romeo slash medical marijuana decision matrix. Um, but one thing I talk about is that this tool has never really been validated. Um, it's based on guidelines that, that associations have put out based on research that they've reviewed. But the tool itself has never been validated, nor has there been any kind of research on the efficacy of the tool in other countries, for that matter. So um, you can take this tool and say, well, that's great that this provides a decision matrix that fits with what um, associations in the United States are recommending based on research. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be the best approach um, in a particular culture or a particular country or with a particular client for that matter. I would love it if somebody who has more time than I have these days maybe wanted to do some research using this tool. I think that would be a great idea for them to do and to see if they can validate it. So right now it's, it's, a, it's a guideline based on practice guidelines that associations have offered. It's not been validated in research and it has not been uh, um, modified for the needs, uh, the needs of different clients from different cultural backgrounds. Yes, thank you. And I just added the link in the chat, so okay, you can you. access you can access the survey uh, Dr. Norton is talking about. Okay, I think we can have one more question. Uh, someone is asking, is medical marijuana a last resort in treatment? Uh, I think I think it depends. Um, again, kind of the, I think that a significant question in medicine is 
what are the expected benefits of this medication and what are the potential drawbacks? And is there a safer option available that we would expect would give provide these benefits for this client? Now, could there be another medication that's more dangerous than cannabis for this client or that we would think would have more adverse effects than cannabis that should be an even later option down the road than cannabis? I certainly think that's true. So I wouldn't go so far as to say it's the last option. I think there are some options that might be even more potentially dangerous or problematic for a client than medical THC would that should be kicked even further down the line of options. Um, but what I am saying is that I think that the front line of treatment ought to be non-addictive options. And um, that when those non-addictive options are e exhausted or they, aren't, uh, they cannot provide sufficient relief, then it makes sense for treatment professionals to start examining options that might come with greater risks, such as medical THC, but also might potentially bring the, um, the added benefit. So let's take the example of the patient with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. There are other medications and other things that those patients can do that might help with nausea and vomiting. If they have tried those safer medication options and they still can't stomach food and they're wasting away, then it would make a lot of sense to me to move on to medical THC um, in a case like that, where the potential benefits could significantly outweigh the potential drawbacks depending on that specific patient's circumstances. That's probably an overly <laughs> lengthy answer to it to that question. I hope yeah, that helps. I, yeah, I think it it gave an overview yeah. about what should be considered. Um, I think we can still have one more question. Um, is it possible to operate a rehab center where some clients are on harm reduction services without influencing the decision of those coming in for total abstinence? Um, okay, I'm, I'm kind of interpreting that question to also mean that one problem is you, you have a treatment center and you have some clients that are like, well, I'm on the harm reduction plan, so I get to continue using cannabis. And they're interacting with other clients who maybe are on an abstinence-based plan who are now saying, well, I want to use, I want to use cannabis also, so I'm going to switch over to the harm reduction plan. Um, and maybe somebody is concerned that one group of clients may affect, you know, the other group of clients negatively in that way. I think that's a concern, and I think it's one that we can't really fully protect against. You can try different things, like you could have two separate programs. There's a harm reduction program and there's a, an abstinence-based program for which the clients don't mix groups or they're, they're separate programs from each other, so there's less opportunity for influence. But I think that one way to address this issue is to really go back to the assessment process up front. If you have clients with moderate to severe substance use disorders and they present with a medical cannabis card, then I think you ought to use the process where you communicate with the prescriber, make sure the prescriber is aware of the client's substance use disorder in great detail. Make sure the prescriber is aware of best practice guidelines that suggest avoiding medical cannabis in these cases, and ask that prescriber whether there are um, uh, non-addictive options that might be viable in this case. And then if that physician doesn't respond or does nothing, then you get a second opinion with the addiction medicine specialist. Only if that addiction medicine specialist says, yes, medical THC is what's needed. Do you make that person eligible for the harm reduction program? So in other words, it's not just whatever the client wants, but it's on a case by case, individual basis based on assessment and on a process that makes somebody eligible for one program or the other. And that might be one way to address the issue. That won't be appropriate in all treatment settings because remember, it, I do work mostly with clients for whom I have no leverage. So they're not here to get a driver's license or to complete probation successfully or anything like that, or to get custody of their children back. They come because they want help. And for those clients, since I have no leverage, when they wanna continue using medical THC, I use a harm reduction approach consistent with their informed choice. Um, others may not, they might wanna discharge them. 
but I do my best to work with them where they're at and see if we can improve the situation or not. So I think it depends. Is this a mandated treatment program? Do you have leverage? What is that individual's case like? How severe is their problem? And have physicians said that there are safer alternatives available for them? These are things we should use to make decisions, not just whether a client decides that they want, you know, medical cannabis or something along those lines. So I think, I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah, it does. And uh, just to mention that uh, you expressed it quite well, and uh, I feel it's a, it's a great point to end on for this session. Uh, I'm sorry for those who are still submitting their questions, just to say that we are receiving so many questions and we, sorry, we couldn't tackle them, but you will find the resources on our website and the recording of our webinar, as well as some references shared with, uh, shared by uh, Dr. Norton. So uh, you can access these later. Um, so thanks again, Dr. Norton, for answering those questions and for the excellent presentation. It was instructive to understand more about medicinal use of cannabis, and it, it was a pleasure to have you with us. It was a pleasure being with you all today. I hope this was a little bit helpful as a, maybe at least an introduction, if nothing else. And um, I wish you all a very meaningful week and great success in helping your clients. Thank you so much. I'd like to, to thank ISAP team, especially Olivia, for providing support for this event. We hope that you will join us for the upcoming webinars organized by ISAP. All webinars are announced on our website, so you can get all the info on isap.net. This concludes the webinar. Thank you all for attending. We hope that you learned and enjoyed the webinar for today. You will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar and, of course, with your certificate. On behalf of ISAP and our presenter, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.